Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 77th lesson of A Course in Miracles. The 77th lesson of A Course in Miracles states, I am entitled to miracles. I am entitled to miracles. And what better lesson for our guest today, y'all? Mm -hmm who embodies all of our entitlements to miracles. In fact, a large part of his message is about the ascension of the entire world. Top 10 best-selling author Franco Romero had a near-death experience which left him clairvoyant. And he is here to share his incredible message of healing for the masses. Franco, thank you very mm -hmm. much for showing, joining us today. Thank you. And wow, what an introduction. Um, I had no idea that this was the message. And it's 77. I love that. Um, a lot of, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in numerology, but there's a lot of cool stuff in that. Um, and so it's perfect. Apropos. Apropos. I love it. I love when when that kind of stuff happens. I know, right? I just love it. So, um, y'all, I gotta tell you, <laughs> Franco just read me up and down, left and right. This man, this is why I reached out to him. This man has incredible uh, wisdom and love behind every single word that he speaks. You can feel it. So I cannot wait. I can't wait for today's session. Uh, and so, Franco, you can start <laughs> where where you start. I'm excited. Okay. Well, um, I'll just share a little bit about my story, a little bit of background. I had a near-death experience when I was six months old. And normally, a lot of people start scratching their heads at that point it's like how do you even remember anything how is this even possible to even talk about something like this at such a young age very valid very valid um i didn't know that i had died at six months i didn't know until i was about 15 or 16 when i started having visions um mostly dreams but visions as well of a night where i kept experiencing the death of this baby that was in a hospital, in an incubator, uh, struggling to breathe, very, very sick with pneumonia, and knowing not really that far into my visions that what I was looking at was something to do with me. Um, very connected to that essence and the people that were there, my mother, my aunts, people that I didn't even know. Um, the details of that whole experience, being there and hearing, not audibly, but actually through feeling, hearing the words, the thoughts, the feelings that people were having in that room, specifically my mother. She was much younger than I knew her to be at 15, 16. And going through the process of that night over and over and over for months where I heard her conversation with the doctor who told her that I came in thinking she thought I just had maybe a chest cold turning out to be pneumonia and it was progressing and within hours of being there my body was starting to shut down and her inability to accept that reality unbeknownst to her she was in the process of creating a miracle that day when she heard the news from the doctor for example she i felt the energy in in that space change completely she had completely disconnected her reality no longer was there and she checked out of the hospital which you would think most parents would probably stay pray do whatever you could to be by the side of your child. But she didn't. She left. And she went to a, a church nearby. And she 
got on her knees as she saw the church about a block away. And she was a very devout Catholic woman. Um, her faith was tremendous. And she kneeled and crawled all the way into the church, up to the altar, where she began to meditate, pray. I call it meditation because it was such a profound prayer that she had. It wasn't about please, please, please. It was almost like she was so grateful and appreciative of the time that she had had with me. I remember her prayer very specifically, and it was so incredibly touching. I remember I was feeling the emotion of that. And after she meditated for a while, this vision occurred in her. I could see it clearly. She started to see a vision of my life in the future. And she could see the person that I would become, the father, the husband, the son, the person who was just giving. And the room, again, everything for me was about energy and nothing was spoken. It was all just there. It was telepathic. And I remember that the room, again, shifted in energy and it became really still. And she felt a sense of peace with the outcome as though whatever she was going back to when she got back to the hospital, she was prepared for it because she pretty much expected that the news wasn't going to be good. Mm -hmm. She knew that she was leaving when I was dying. In fact, the, the hospital, the doctors had brought in a priest to give me my last rites. They expected me to probably last no more than a couple hours. In that short time that she was gone, she came back to the hospital and she was greeted by people who were crying, but they were tears of joy. The doctors were stunned at how things changed in the short period of time. My vitals came back. My bodily functions, my organs, they all came back. Basically, I was pretty much healthy again. And all they could do, and they still do this to this day, but back then it was even more common. They just chalked it up as a miracle, as an act of God. And they left it at that. I was checked out the next day. And my life went on a few months later. We were living in South America at the time. I was on my way to the U.S. where I have where I've been all my life since then. But there was another part to the dream, and there was and this part was even more profound in many ways. I saw what happened in those two hours or so that I was in the hospital. I saw myself sort of in the essence of that child and i was pulled out of that experience and i went into what most people talk about this place where for me it came out for whatever reason as this i was in this huge desert and everywhere i looked there was just sand there was a couple of things that happened in that but but the biggest thing was that i kept looking up at the sun because people were looking up at the sun i thought they were looking at me at first but they were looking up at the sun and when i looked up at the sun it was this huge ball it was about 10 times easily 10 times bigger than our sun mm. and i remember thinking wow it's huge and more than that i was i was so perplexed at the idea that it wasn't hurting my eyes i could just stare at it mm. didn't didn't bother my eyes at all and there was this radiant energy coming from it. It was warm. It, it was peaceful. It was loving. And so I kept looking down to see why if people were still looking up. And as every time I looked up, this ball kept coming closer and closer. When it finally consumed me, I felt this massive, massive, massive release of energy. It was like the cells, every cell in my body was vibrating uncontrollably. And I could feel the consciousness of each cell. I felt each cell as if it were me. Mm. I felt 50 trillion me's begging for this light that was coming close to me. And I remember sitting there and going, how is this possible? How can I experience myself all these different ways? It was 
really mind blowing, but I didn't have time to really sit there and experience that because I was just absolutely becoming engrossed with the rapture of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. When it finally came in and through me, I literally felt every aspect of me, all those different cells literally blew up. It just, it just became one. I just became a light with that light. Now, the interesting thing about that is that when that happened, I saw silhouettes of beings that were all around me. But these three or four in particular came out of this group. And even though I couldn't see their faces, I couldn't really see any characteristic of who they are, man, woman, or whatever, I knew who they were. I, I knew that they were family. I knew that I was home again. I knew that I had experienced this many, 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 many times before. And that home to me wasn't just this home that I had just left. It was lifetimes of homes. It was places that didn't even exist here because it wasn't here. It was somewhere else, way, way far away. Not in this universe, in other universes, in other dimensions. I knew myself to be all of that. And these beings, were also from that space. But here's the other thing is that when I saw that, I looked around and this whole light was filled. It was filled with trillions and trillions and tr unlimited number of beings. And they all were focused on me. And I was focused on them. And the crazy reason I was focused on them was because I remembered them and they remembered me every single being in that space i knew them and they knew me and just before i was pulled back out of that experience and i really couldn't tell you how long this was because they all gave me this hug and if i had arms i hugged them back but it didn't really matter because when they gave me that hug if i hadn't already felt the clarity of what i was it became obvious at that point. I was completely and entirely lost into the oneness. I was still me, but I was gone. Mm. And I didn't want to come back. I didn't want to go back to this. Mm. So at that moment, there was this presence around me. And I had felt the presence the whole time. But it became really clear there was this presence around me and I could feel that it was guiding me through things that I wasn't even fully aware of at the time because it took many years after this to realize that that experience actually had other moments to it. But the part that I could only remember was this moment of being present in the light and yeah. this being, this essence of consciousness, I call it, was really focused on me being really focused on what I was experiencing. It was as though it didn't want me to leave until I could fully appreciate the experience. Mm -hmm. Years later, I knew that that would be because I needed to come back and share this, but there was more to this. And this is the part that I come back with now that I tell near-death experiencers about because they too forgot things that even they remembered from their experience when they died. The part that they wanted me to see was with regard to all the lights, all the silhouettes, all of the beings that were present there. It, it dawned on me because they kept asking me, what do you see? And I knew it wasn't this because you don't have eyes there. You have eyes. You can see things 360. What they meant was, what was I really feeling, experiencing? What was it that I was experiencing in that moment? And it took a bit because at first I didn't care. I was like, whatever, I want to stay here. You, you, we can get to that later. I remember that so clearly. It was like, what, what, you know? Um, but when I realized what they were trying to show me to experience when i realized that when i had that aha moment i felt like sort of this proverbial arm on my shoulder and it took me and it whisked me right out of that arena right out of that room right out of that space i went back through the tunnel like people talk about with all 
just all these incredible lights. It was a very translucent tunnel because I could see this stream of infinity everywhere. But I was in this space that it was like a tunnel and it pulled me back. And the next thing I knew, I landed in my body 15 years later. And because that's when I had the experiences. And so I kept all of this to myself for the longest time until I finally couldn't do it anymore. And I had to tell somebody. But back then, and I'm trying to age me here. But back then, there were no internet stuff. There wasn't all of this stuff that people had access to. It was basically me. I had to figure it out. Because if I didn't, well, then people would, I would try to medicate me <laughs> because I was delusional. Or they would try to save me because I was having a demonic experience or something in between. So I kept it to myself as long as I could until I finally broke down and I had to share it with my with somebody. So I shared it with my mom. And I remember being in the kitchen with her and she was and I started explaining it to her. And at first she was just kind of humoring me. But when I got into the part of being very specific about what happened in the hospital and the exact conversation she had with the doctors and the exact prayer that she had in the church by herself where she wasn't talking out loud she was just feeling it that's what blew her mind and she said i don't know exactly how you know this but it has to be a miracle another miracle of the whole event and you have to share this and i said uh with who and that began my long, long, long spiritual crisis that consumed me until I finally started to wake up some 10, 12 years ago. So that's where I'm, how it all started for me. Wow. What a profound experience. Thank you for sharing. So you... So basically, as a teenager, you were able to experience exactly what your soul experienced when you were a baby. Yeah, which at the time, you know, in the world of linear, linearity timelines, this third dimensional world, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. But in the world of the metaphysical, the higher dimensions, the spirituality and, and dimensionality, there's no such thing as time. Yeah. I was able to experience it because everything is in the present moment of the now. So to get me back there was simply to be present in the now, experiencing it as it was happening, not as not in sort of third party looking mm -hmm. at it like you would see in movies. I was actually experiencing it in the moment because it was happening in the moment. And was this spontaneous, Franco, or did you go into a meditation and saw all this? No, what it, what it did, and it and it does. I think a lot of people can relate to this. I was going at that time through some pretty serious personal, emotional, mental crises as a teenager. Mm -hmm. I was really feeling enormously disconnected. Um, I couldn't, you know, you see this a lot now with teenagers and kids, but adults too. But I was experiencing a major disconnection with this reality. I could not. Yeah make sense of it yeah. at all things just did not make sense at any of it any of it and i had nowhere to turn to so i turned to the only thing i could turn to i started praying to this thing and really asking this thing please i need it now i need whatever it is that i need i need it now because i can't take this anymore and through that i accessed a portal and that is how it began. And in most cases with people who have had, they don't have to have near-death experiences for this, but when people hit really super rock bottom and they have a spiritual, what I call, or what we call spiritually transformative experiences, they go deep within themselves and they are able to access a part of their divinity that unlocks the higher aspects of who they are without them, then, without them even knowing it. That's what happened with my mother that night. She didn't realize that she had moved a mountain. She did. And instead of focusing on the NDE, I mean, instead of focusing on that, on what she did, I spent my entire life focusing on, oh, I had an NDE, which in and of itself is remarkable. 
Mm-hmm. But it was the story behind the story behind the story that was the most significant. And I talk about that in the book that I wrote, because that's where the true beauty of the truth comes out. That's the mystery that we're supposed to try to unsolve, that to solve, I should say. But we don't see it because it's not clear. It's not clear enough. So the other thing I forgot to mention, and it's not one that's taken lightly, is that in the process of coming back from that experience, from the actual NDE, the reason I was feeling so disconnected by the time I was 15, 16 was because I felt as though I didn't quite fit into this body. Mm-hmm. So for a lot of people who know about spirituality in the metaphysical sense and have been watching shows like yours they understand that this is a vessel and it a suit Mm -hmm. and for me the suit never fit right it was as though it just didn't fit right and i couldn't figure out why and for the longest time even after i had my nde i thought it was because i had an nde and somehow that sort of did something Mm -hmm. but in future episodes of my channeling because the whole crisis goes into how I eventually became aware of who I was and I started to accept it and I started to use the abilities that I came back with, which a lot of ND years have, but they refuse to use them or are are, are not fully aware that they have them. And we all have this, by the way, we just are a little more sensitive to it when we have a near death experience or a spiritual transformative experience. Okay. Mm -hmm. We all have them. And what I came to realize was that in the process of being there, the original spirit, the original soul that was in my body stayed. And I came back here as a walk-in, which if for those who do not know what walk-ins are, uh, they are spiritual entities, beings that are given permission by the existing soul who had used the vessel they have to have permission. If that soul does not want to stay in this body, then they can give that vessel, the body, to a spirit, a, a being, a spiritual being, who's here for a specific reason. Um, these are usually what we call emissaries from source, God, divine. And that's why I couldn't fit into my suit, because I wasn't quite, <laughs> I didn't get quite tailored right with it. So I was having a real, real spiritual experience. I was having a mental experience when I started activating my clairvoyance. And it was through those processes that the most of us wake up our clairvoyant abilities. We just don't know it. We start talking to voices or hearing voices or having more intuitive gut reactions, but we always shut them down. And that's unfortunately not what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. when voice is trying to speak to you that's kind of a long-winded answer but i hope that gave you a flavor for what happened incredible so um did your original soul exit when you were a baby yes and that news gotcha yes. and it all came back to you when you were old enough to kind of yes. that's it much of this came back to me um in channeling experiences that I had afterwards when I started to tap into my clairvoyance. I started to see how that exchange occurred and it all made sense at that point. But I didn't talk about that either. (laughs) In fact, I didn't say anything about my walking experience until very recently because it wasn't actually quite relevant. People were still trying to figure out NDEs and all of the stuff that came with it. Mm -hmm. But it's becoming more relevant now with walk-ins because they're I'm not the only one um there are many walk-ins here and as I said they're emissaries they came here specifically with a purpose that was sent directly from whatever we want to call it source God spirit um that's their function and in my case I came here to help humanity wake up so you came with that purpose yes of humanity wow that's incredible. Thank you for sharing. Um, I, you know, I've heard your story before, and I thought, and what was astounding to me, what came to me when I heard about the prayer that your mom did, was I know that gratitude is one of the highest vibrations we can have. Yes. 
And so her making a prayer of gratitude as opposed to a prayer of supplication, right? Uh, please, you know, you know, save them or whatever, but for her to say, thank you for the time I had. Uh, do you think that is, that was the opening for the miracle? That was exactly the key to the miracle. And that's why we take things like that and we hear about gratitude and we hear about appreciation. And there's a whole chapter that, by the way, the book that I wrote, it's called The Closet Spiritualist. I did it in a channeling state. I didn't know what I was going to be writing. I was just dictating. And in one of the chapters, it's called The Attributes. And the attributes list all of these magical pieces that you have. They're actually six sense pieces that we don't take, we don't use. We take them for granted. And one of them is gratitude. Gratitude is a is a frequency. It's a thought form of the divine. And if you use it right, it opens up doors. And when I say that she actually moved a mountain that day, she did. She used gratitude and appreciation and triggered a release of energy that would be the likes of which we would call a miracle. Wow. Talk about your book a little bit for us. Do you have it with you, Franco, to, to show? Well, uh, actually, I do, but it wasn't in it by intent. Um I just happened to have it. So the that's closet spiritualist. Absolutely. I always like to highlight. Well, thank you. But in the ears, um, you know, the, have, uh, the, the reason. Um, so let me just tell you, um, and I'll just be real quick about this. I've never talked about okay. this before, but you can see that it's got a door and it's a closet and the light that shines is your light. It's your light. Okay. Your light is God and it has to come shining through now. And there's a reason for this, because there's portals. Everything is about portals and energy streams. And to your question about my mom, again, it has to do with how you access portals and energy streams. To become who you are, you have to cross through this multidimensional layer of yourself. And so to do a door like that was intentional because I wanted to show people who they are. That we're not just talking about a physical closet, mm -hmm. talking about a spiritual closet. It is extraordinarily powerful. It literally is a portal to your higher self. So when I wrote the book, it was funny because about four years ago or so, I had no intention of writing a book. Mm -hmm. I had, I just had none. <laughs> I mean, there was nothing that was inspiring me to do it. Mm -hmm. I was starting to come out of my spiritual closet. I was starting to realize who I really am. And I began to speak about it just to whomever, whomever, friends or whatever. And and um, as it's always been the case, because I talk about this in the book, and I also have talked about this in various other sh shows and in the documentary that was done on the book, um, that... I had these moments where Kayla, the, the collective that speaks to me, which is the same collective that everybody else has. I always try to explain that it's like being inside a big, big, big room where there's a lot of switchboard operators and they're plugging in, you know, a call. And I just happen to be plugging into one side of the room, whereas maybe Esther with Esther Hicks and, and, and Abraham and others are co are connecting on others or other channelers. It's all the same thing. It's all the same thing. But Caleb was, at, in that time of my life, coming through often uh, abruptly through other people. Um, mm -hmm. I had many different experiences where time would stop, literally stop. Um, there were some really good ones um, that are talked about in the book where um, – I saw the simulation of reality. It did, I didn't know what that was at the time. It took me a long time to process that, but time would literally stop and the person I would be speaking to would have a tone and inflection in their voice. They became very clear to me because it was very similar to the voice that I heard in my near-death experience. And then also later on, not much later on in my early life when I was living in a, a house that I called the hauntings. So I lived 
five, six years in a house that was absolutely possessed. <laughs> but this voice wasn't one of those voices. This voice was this beautiful, comforting voice that was there. And Caleb would like to come in through other people. And um, at one point, I was at a, a restaurant, a cafe, to be more specific. And I was with a couple of people. And the, Caleb came through one of them and said, you, you are to write a book. And I was like, okay. I said, I have no idea what I'm supposed to write. And they said, we will show you. And then within about a week later, I told my wife, I said, I'm supposed to write a book. And she wasn't quite familiar yet with Caleb. Um, and I said, I just need to write a book. And she said, what is it going to be about? I said, I don't know. And she said, okay. I said, I'm just going to go downstairs and I'm going to start to channel. And whatever comes, comes. And that was the beginning of the book. And then it's interesting because it became such an intimate experience. Um, by the time I finished reading the book, I'm reading the book. I read it like 20 times because I don't, you know, people will ask me, you know, well, you're so full of wisdom and stuff. And it's like, well, you know what? I had to go through the same trials and tribulations to get to where I am now. Mm -hmm. I wasn't given a free pass just because I came here to forget. And, and to remember, just like everybody else. So I was going to have to go through it all. But I remember that I was writing the book and I was finishing the last section of the book, last literally the last chapter of the, of the book. And they were, they, they were insistent on finishing the book where they could speak. I mean, throughout the whole book, there's a lot of dialogue. But here they wanted the last word. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's fine. <laughs> you know, basically the whole book is about you anyway. So just say it anyway. Um, and there are a lot of anecdotal stuff in the book. So it's really easy to read because I, I, I really wanted and they wanted me to share my life with people to show them that I didn't just become this guru or something out of nowhere. I went through what they're going through. It was so important that people see the human side of me um, so that they could relate to it themselves. But at the end, I said, okay, go for it. Just write. And I got so emotional. I was, you know, it was like one of those movies where you're, the, the author is crying while they're writing the last section of the book, you know. Mm -hmm. And I remember getting to the last sentence, and I knew it was the last sentence. I could feel the energy was diminishing, and it was ending. And I hit the, I, I got the, the last period on the sentence, and I said, thank you so much. I really, 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 really was so sad that this was over. And then he said, you're not done yet. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, um, you're going to write eight more books. And I said, what? <laughs> I didn't even know what I was writing in this book. I had no idea that I had 10 chapters worth of things to say. And they said, you're going to, now you're telling me I'm going to write eight more books. I have no idea what I'm going to write about eight, eight more books. I mean, part of me was happy and the, most of me was just like floored. So then they said, we will show you. And they told me to sit down and I spent the next hour and a half writing the synopsis for eight amazing books about things that I wasn't even sure how I was going to begin. And one of them was on alchemy, um, the mind alchemy. And that's the one I'm writing about now. It's called The Modern Day Alchemist. And I said, I have no idea about alchemy. I've never practiced it. I don't study it. They said, we will show you. And I'm now I'm halfway through the book and I'm like, oh, dang. Okay. All right. Just go. Just, I'm just, just take me, just go. And so, yeah. And that's how it is. That is fast, fun, There is, <laughs> there is so much juice <laughs> to your story. There's so <laughs> much. First of all, the people who would channel Caleb to you. Were they do they just blank out? Were they aware they that they blank out? They, were? they blank out. They blank out for for in some instances, um, it could be minutes, more than minutes. And they lit it's like time literally stops, except for me and that person. And then when Caleb's done speaking, um everything resumes again. And for them, it was like a second. For me, it would have been, could have been five, 10 minutes, easily half hour. 
That is, my goodness, that's incredible. That's powerful stuff. That is powerful stuff. So before we move on, <laughs> um, a person seeking what should get your book? What what will they find your personal experience and, and what else? The truth. The truth. The truth of who they are. The truth, not mine. The truth. The truth, the truth that's been spoken for thousands of years. The one that you know because you are. Yes. Yes. I love that. I love that. So get that. I'm definitely, as soon as I'm hanging up, I'm getting that book. <laughs> um, so I have heard, I've heard you say that the energy, and I want to, I want to talk about this for a little bit. The energy of desire creates worlds for us. I, I think I've heard you say, and what, what, caught me about that is is I've always kind of had the subconscious belief that desiring something pushes it away from me. Yeah. But I also but I so I loved hearing from from you that no desire is a creative energy. Can you talk a little bit about that for us? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um so you know, I feel that most people who will listen to this will understand that there is at least a remote possibility that we're existing in a simulation and we won't have time to get into that much. But mm -hmm. if you just humor me for the moment and let's assume that we are in the simulation, we created a world to be more specific. You created your world. We call it a lesson plan. OK, that mirrors who you are not in your real essence of spirit so everything is contrast in that world okay everything everything so everything that makes sense is flipped upside down and we're expected to live exist within the reality of the things that don't make sense and this should sound really familiar for most people because we go out through our whole lives going this just absolutely does not make sense none of this makes sense so the things that do make sense are flipped upside down so that you have a harder time finding your way back to the truth so that you can explore every avenue possible, trip over every wire possible to find it, to master it. And desire is one of those. Desire, I know there is a, there is a religious practice which... I don't need to say which one that actually does not look well on desire. Desire is the one of the most powerful streams of feeling. The most powerful stream of feeling. I'm going to change that. Other than say love. That creates realities. That creates worlds. That manifests. And why? Wow. Because when you want something, you come from a place of lack. Mm -hmm. When you desire something, you come from a place of having. Mm -hmm. And if you have something and you desire, you desire more of it. It's the difference between reacting and creating. It's a third dimensional ability we have. We're masters at wanting reacting we don't realize that we're equally masters of creating mm. and desiring they work hand in hand you cannot create you cannot manifest anything anything that you desire consciously without desire it is just absolutely against the universal law which is why people struggle with their lives, trying to figure out what their lives are, much less trying to manifest whatever it is that they want in the physical, money, love, whatever, because they're coming from a place of lack. Mm -hmm. That's third dimensional. So you get third dimensional reactions. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, 
um uh, I've heard you talk about this is the age of miracles. Oh yeah. Can you tell? And I've heard I've heard non-physical beings say that this is the end of the spiritual season. So I'm wondering if, if yes. that's the same thing. They are the same about thing. About that. What is that? What is that? You and I had a really short conversation before we got on. And we talked about bringing heaven on earth. Yeah. And this is the season for that. It's not going to last a thousand years. It's not going to start a thousand years from now or even a hundred years from now. It's it's happening right now. It's happening right now. And when I say that there is an age of miracles, it's the transition period from where we believe that we are in this third dimensional reality, struggling through everything. And then experiencing things that let's just call them supernatural or miracles because we're trans. Some of us are awakening faster mm -hmm. than others. And those who are awakening are becoming more aware of who they are and who are they. This is the toughie. They become aware that they are God. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they go, hmm, that's a pretty big pill to swallow. Because we've been told all our whole lives that we're not God. That if anything, we're this very insignificant thing going through this whatever world that we're in. And we matter little in the grand scheme of things other than we have to be obedient. But I never finished the story about what I saw. So this relates perfectly. So thank you for asking the question that brought it all back again. What I saw was the truth of who we are and that's when they whisked me back and what is the truth of who we are the truth of it was that even though in today's world we are at least starting to get to the idea that there is this spark of divinity in us so it used to be that all oh, you know you're just pretty much screwed right from the beginning you have original sin you have karma you have all sorts of things going against you it's just bad news all the way around okay we've gone from that you know, there's still a lot of that still present, but we've gone from that to now, hey, there's there's a spark of divinity in you. You just got to access that. Yeah. And though there is truth to that piece, the greater truth is the one that we're not seeing. It's the message. It's the riddle behind the riddle, okay, or the clue behind the clue. What I saw at that moment before I got whisked back into my body was is that all of these individual beings – that went on for infinity, they came together. They came together at a point when they realized as supreme beings that they could realize themselves, experience themselves as something greater if they formed oneness. Mm. They created oneness. We created oneness because mm. we are them, not the other way around. God didn't all of a sudden one day say, mm -hmm, I want to express myself because I'm bored and I want to feel you know, what it's like to not be me. So I'm going to just break myself up into trillions of little individual me's. That's not the whole picture. The whole picture was that it did that breaking up because it realized it was a trillion little me's. It was the individual collectiveness. That's why most psychics, most channelers, at least the deeper ones call this the collective we created oneness now all of a sudden the narrative changes dramatically from us not even being in the equation to maybe us being a speck of the equation to all of a sudden realizing we are the creation we are the equation it changes everything and that's what I had to see in order to bring that back and share that with humanity. And that's written everywhere. If you dig not very far into the literature of everything, if you look at the science, the math mathematics of everything, it tells the same story. We are God. And if that wasn't enough, I had various visions of this because, you know, I'm being human and I needed to ask the question, well, if I'm going to stick my neck out and say this to the world, 
can I get some sense of reaffirmation that there was something that I could kind of point to? And they said, yeah. So one night I was channeling and they showed me a chapter. I'm not a biblical person, but they showed me a chapter. It was Genesis chapter one, verse 26. And in that chapter, it talks about the creation of, well, back then it was man, but now it's humanity. But in that verse, everything that was referred back to God was in the plural. Let us create man in our image. And I'm going, whole, MG, this is right in front of us. In one of the greatest documents historically. And it never got asked why it was like that. So I was like, okay, fair enough. I'll say no. That um I've been I've been nodding my head. Um I I actually that's that's amazing that you talked about that. I've <laughs> taught in one of in one of these videos now um from that and yes you're right in genesis he does say let us create man in our image and i have made that point that it is plural that's i love that and i'm just yeah. so you see how the narrative gets flipped upside down and it's our jobs to flip it right side up again yeah but it changes everything Everything that we know ourselves to be, everything we know about the universe, everything we know about this place we call Earth, nature, everything, science, everything gets changed instantaneously. And I actually do show how it changes instantaneously in another parallel reality. The moment that we, and it doesn't have to be the whole group of humanity, but it's the more we grow as consciousness collectively we get to a certain point and when that tips everything changes because people always ask me how is it possible in this age of miracles that we're going to see what you say we're going to see which is basically hey look i was told that we will see no more death there will be no more death the physical body does not have to die to experience itself as god vehicle it's a vehicle so it doesn't have to experience it at all not in its collective i mean in its collectiveness yes but doesn't have to you as consciousness as god don't have to leave the body in order to experience what other near-death experiencers have experienced you don't have to there will be no death there will be no aging there will be no disease there will be not, none of that there will be no poverty there will be no hunger There'll be no need for financial institutions to govern any kind of monetary system of any kind. There'll be no governments. There'll be nothing. And you say, this is all going to happen in the next eight to 10 years. I know. It, I know. It seems crazy. But the answer is absolutely yes. Wow. So, Franco, that sounds incredible. Um, and I've heard that <clears throat> before it is resonant with me. So first, first, right. <laughs> we got to the first, most of us grew up in some kind of religion and we're even told we were born in, in sin. We've, we've kind of gotten beyond that where we are starting to hear we are God, which is like, sounds like blasphemy, right? Yeah. We would have been burned at the stake. Not yeah, too long. absolutely. Absolutely. And so now, now we are at a place where we're hearing that and it's not going away, right? So we're hearing it more often. How do we transition? So a lot of us have it in our head. Okay, they're saying, I'm God. We are one. We are God. How do we step into that space of experiencing ourselves as God? And well, so, I know that's a loaded question because that's yeah, it a is. process. <laughs> uh, does your book help that per help a person begin to, to self-realize in that way? 
You know, it's funny you, you say it that way because I always tell people that the book, at least the first half of the book, the second half of the book gets really more into the, how how reality works and some of the prophecies that were given to me about this time and and you know those kind of things very similar in many ways to uh, like a Dolores Cannon even though I didn't know about Dolores until just actually around the time that I started right you know exposing the book to the world mm -hmm. um the first half of the book is about my experiences and how I struggled through that question and so I always tell people that the book is serves as a guide as a manual of sorts it's not going to give you the you know do this do this do this do this and therefore, this is going to happen. And if, if anything, it's going to tell you, don't do this. Mm. Don't fight this. Don't resist this. Because it's our fighting, our resistance, our disbelief in our in the potential of who we are that keeps us from realizing who we are. Mm. And my whole story is about that. If you want to go through the, the crash course of beating yourself up well you don't even need my book for that but if you want to see how i did it <laughs> it's right there if you want to see how not to do it just do the exact opposite of what i did in most of my book in at least the first half of the book i mean there's a lot of value in in the stuff because i talk about the dream states and the simulation i talk about how we create reality but i always put it within the context of how i struggled with it because I denied myself the opportunity to accept that as possible in me. Mm -hmm. How could it be possible that me of 8 billion people, why me? And I came to realize, why not me? Mm -hmm. So yes, that will do it. But a lot of that has to do with probably one of the biggest questions that we deal with every day, and that's our faith. Faith is a monster of a term. Yeah. We use it very loosely and we give it different definitions and we actually interchange it with words like hope and believe and all sorts of other things. But when we get back to it again, it's about how do you use those words to express higher levels of consciousness? We don't use faith in that way. We barely know what faith is. And when we do, we usually explain within the context of how we believe in something out there. And we really don't even know what that out there really is. Or we give a definition of that out there presence as if we know it really well because we've been ingrained with it all our lives. If we don't have faith in the way that we are meant to, which in the awakening process is all about going inward. It's about having faith as we talked about before we got on, mm -hmm. it's about faith in yourself. If you don't have that, you won't get yourself out of this game. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I have heard indeed that this is a game. Yes. Indeed. And the only way to get out of it is to go inward. Mm -hmm deeply inward you go oh my god that sounds like a lot of work it doesn't have to be work it could be entirely play and so one of the things that i was shown and it's actually referenced biblically it's referenced in buddhism and hinduism and in other major and just indigenous religions and spiritual practices is the reference of a child in my book, it's called The Inner Child. It's an omnipotent presence of, of what we call God. It is absolutely one of the most powerful presences of spirituality in the entire multiverse. We tend to, in the game, downsize that child image so much so that we actually make the child seem like a victim. The child has to be healed. It's hurt. When we don't realize that it's the child that is the key by which you will remember who you are. And it will, in essence, heal you. Not the other way around. So you have to release yourself and surrender yourself to that child essence. Become it again. Become what it was that you, that you are before you became a physical body, before you may have experienced the traumas of childhood. 
there's an innocence in the presence that is so enormously powerful. I mean, you can't, it creates universes instantaneously. And we call that God, but that's an essence of God is the child. In biblical terms, Yeshua said, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless you embrace it like a child. Buddha and Hinduism talk about the child as the way in which to get into the unknown. This wasn't just flowery words. They're right in your face. Make sense? Yeah. Simple? You bet. So I brought back a practice of, it's called the way of the inner child. And it's a powerful practice. It's a powerful and yet stupidly simple practice. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. The way of the inner child. You're right. The end. There, there are a lot of religious texts that talk a lot about the child. You're absolutely, you're absolutely if, right. If the, if the child were, if the child was truly wounded, hurt, as we teach it in psychology today, mm -hmm. again, everything's flipped upside down to keep you from seeing it so obviously then why would Yeshua or others say that the only way into the kingdom of heaven is through the child? That must mean that the child has enormous, omnipotent power. It's the only way. I cannot let you go <laughs> without... Um, without you sharing your spiritually transformative experience you had at the airport. Oh, you yes. have to relay that. <laughs> because I, um, hearing that story yeah. does something for the listener. Because it um, is an experience that relays the power of that which you say we all are. So I would love to hear that. Okay. So um, this gets even back to the story of my mother. Okay. This gets back to what we all have. We keep saying we don't, we can't, we don't know how, whatever. But this is how simple it is. And you don't have to even buy into it, all right? You just have to have a moment where you let go of everything that you believe. Because without doing that, if you don't do that, whatever it is that you're experiencing at that moment, which usually is something that has to do with maybe life or death, something really extreme, if you wanted to change drastically, you have to surrender and give everything, just throw it out the door. Mm -hmm. And typically we do. When we're in a crisis, like just in that moment of crisis where there's something that is just all of a sudden hits you right between the eyes for a brief moment before you switch into human mode and you start to pray to something out there, there is something innate in you mm. that makes you go deep within yourself. This is what got into my mother. She went deep within herself and she does. She, she remembers telling me that she remembers and telling me that she doesn't even remember how she did it. But she, in the moment when I was dying in the moment in Arizona, Phoenix airport, I was there because I was starting some work thing and I brought my family with and they were little. And so it was a great opportunity for us to get away, especially because we live in the upper Midwest. And it was January and my wife had my son in one hand and she had my daughter in a, in a little carry on. What do, I forget what they're called now. It's been so long now. Um, but she was basically about two months old, three months old. Mm -hmm. And I went to go get a car. And in Phoenix, like in many airports, the car rental area is out, not quite off site, but you have to go outside of the terminal and go track down the car and then have to bring it back. And when I did that, I missed my my exit or my entrance into that part where you can now just kind of roll the car up curbside and pick up everybody. Instead, I went on the other lanes, which basically meant that I was going to be very far away from where they were coming out of. 
So instead of going around the airport again, I decided to park the car where I thought it would be visible enough that my wife could see me and where I thought I could run across the street and grab them and bring stuff over. When she came out and I had already pulled over and I was standing outside of the car, when she came out, she was completely distracted, looking left and right to see where I was because she was expecting me to be curbside. So I started to yell out to get her attention. And the only attention I got was my son, who at the time was about two, two and a half years old. And he was holding her hand and he was so excited to see me that he let go of her and just started to make a beeline to me. And I realized at that moment, as I looked down a ways, I could see that there was this stream of cars coming at him and they weren't slowing down. You know, the first lane or so people are pulling on curbside, but the other ones are passing it up and they're going at a pretty good clip. And in particular, the cars in front, the ones that were in front, they were going easily about 25 miles per hour, easily. Um, I remember that he had seconds. He literally had seconds. He wasn't going to be able to cross that. It was like a three or four lane street, highway, whatever you call it, pathway. And there was just no way that he was going to cross it. I knew that he was on a collision course with one of the main cars in the front. Whatever happened at that moment, how it happened was that even to this day, something that I look back in astonishment because at that moment I felt both helpless. That was the human side of me that felt helpless because I was about to see my son get hit. And basically at two years of age, he was going to die or he was going to be extraordinarily injured. So at that moment, for whatever reason, I went inward. I went so far in. I threw everything out. I didn't even know I did it. I just threw everything out. My belief system, everything just was like, get out of the way. I'm going in as far as I could. And I did what any parent would do. But there was something intensely rich about what I had just done. And I remember when I was doing it and later on re recalling it, there was like, what was I doing there? Something happened. I went so far in that when I yelled it out, I said, no, I screamed no at the top of my lungs. It was the only thing I could hope for in that situation. And when I screamed, I saw the echo of my no vibrating off of everything at their airport. Where I was standing, I could I could see a really clear path to the runways of a lot of, of the planes taking off. They were taxiing and running running on the on the runways. I saw everything bounce off of this literally this three dimensional thing I thought was my reality. It was bouncing off walls, air, air, air taxis, cars, people, planes. I could just see it. It was just bouncing, and when it stopped bouncing off of this. Everything stopped. Everything stopped. I mean, it was like the power of that vibration and the no literally caused the universe at that moment to say, stop. And I remember looking around. I'm going, oh, my. I was like, what the hell is happening? This just went from three dimensions to two dimension. And what I saw was everything was waving. Like when you see earthquakes, you know, if you see the wave pattern of the energy, yeah. everything was waving as though I was watching everything, everything on a screen, mm. on this thin screen that was two dimensional. Everything became two dimensional. Everything became two dimensional. I mean, to this day, as I'm rec recalling it, it's like I could see it. It was all two dimensional. And it was waving on the screen like like the, like there was wind there, but there was no wind. It was my vibration that was causing the waviness of that screen. And then as that happened, I had an out of mind experience, I call it. I found myself whisked into the car of the person who was driving. And I remember screaming that same no in the car. I remember her. She was a young lady. She, her passenger was probably her boyfriend. They, she hits the brake. She's way, way, she's still about 20 feet away from my son, but she heard it as though I was screaming in her head and she slams the brake. She hits the steering wheel. He goes forward. They literally stop. I whisk myself back into my body 
And then all of a sudden that two dimensional screen went three dimensional again. And everybody just picked up where they left off, except that the cars had stopped momentarily. And my son crossed the street and then everything started up again, everything. And I sat there and if it wasn't for the intensity of that whole experience of losing my son, and I say this, and I talk about this in the book, that it's in, that was so intense that all I could focus on was that. But it didn't take very long for me to realize that something extraordinary happened at that moment. I got to see for the first time in my life, just a glimpse of the simulation of this reality. And that blew my mind. Wow. That blew my mind. Wow, that is what an incredible experience. You know, yeah, you know, and, and the biggest thing that really got me was that no, nobody came up to us. Nobody said, are you all right? Is he okay? You guys need anything? They just went on their way like robots, like digital beings. And when I say that I saw the simulation, I not only saw the simulation, but I started to ask deep burning questions about who is real and who is not. And that's when I, that was also the introduction to things like the backdrop, the backdrop of people. I mean, there was so much going on. My brain almost blew up. Um, two questions. How did your wife experience that same moment? What was her experience? Of she, great question. She experienced the same thing, except there was a little glitch in her time. In other words, she experienced not the stopping of everything. She experienced the stopping, but she doesn't recall any of the other things that happen. She does. She just, for her, it was as though the cars naturally stopped. He ran across and everything went on. Remember, I was telling you that in my experiences, things that could take minutes will be like a second or two for people. That's how she experienced it. But she also does recognize that something happened in that glitch moment because she too remembers that he was going to die. But all of a sudden he was running across the street and everything had stopped, unbeknownst to her. That's an incredible. <laughs> yeah, I oh, I love that. That's just oh, I love it. Um, and I've had okay. several of those. So, um, I yeah, I really want. We're, we're running out of time, but I want. I just I'll get the book. I'll get some some more of these <laughs> STEs because I love it. It it puts us in touch with what we've been talking about. Yeah being God. Yes. You referenced backdrop people. Can you talk a little bit about that? And I'm because I'm gonna say this. Years ago, um talking about Dolores Cannon, I used to do hypnotherapy. I mean I do I stopped after COVID. Uh but when I was doing hypnotherapy before COVID, uh I hypnotized this young lady, powerful uh, young lady. When I counted her down back to this dimension, right? Mm -hmm. She opened her eyes and she was like, you are so beautiful. And I'm like, thank <laughs> you. I'm like, you, you need something to drink? You need, you know, because you have to kind of take care of the person uh, with hypnotherapy. Uh, but I, so she, she was like, no, she was like, I see your aura. So basically after that hypnotherapy session, her, her vision changed. She no longer saw people yeah. the same way, you know, the same way. So something definitely happened during that session. The reason I bring that up <clears throat> is about a month after that she tells me she's like yeah I, I was like do you still see like auras and she said yes she said but when I go to work and I go to some meetings there are some people around the table that have no aura and she was like I don't know 
like what that means, but some people don't have an aura. And so when you've talked mm-hmm. about the backdrop people, and I've also heard this in other places, it made me think of that. And so, yes, I would like for you to talk a little bit about uh, your, you know, the what you call backdrop people. Well, I'll tell you a real quick story, which I've never really shared before, but um, so as part of a, let's just call it a challenge. I was, um, I was convinced to do a hypnotherapy session. Um, and the person that was selected for it was um, pretty well versed in stuff like this, like what you were doing. And, um, and I remember that I, when I, when they were counting down um I became very lucid in my awareness of what was happening. I felt I was still there, but I felt detached in many ways. And um, I'll make a long story really short. It didn't last as long as I had hoped because I began to, um, there was the other aspects of the collective became very attuned to, this was my opportunity. This is our opportunity to talk. And not that any of them don't, because they're always constantly talking. Uh, but um, when I, not very far into it, I came out of the hypnotherapy and I found that the ther- the person who was doing the therapy, the session, was on her knees crying um, because apparently, and, and I can't say now what it was, but apparently there was a lot that they said about her, her life, about everything. It was like all of a sudden the therapy had turned to her and she was absolutely bawling um, and thanking us for the opportunity. <laughs> I'm like, going, but I was going to do this about me. So it didn't last very long, but it was a, it was really profound. So I do believe that for people who want to explore that, there's a lot to it and it just that in her case she realized who we were and couldn't handle a lot of what was being said so mm. um it was beyond even stuff that she knew from dolores and others so uh, so that's a little story little side note um the um the question about the digital people is pretty simple um the digital people everything has consciousness but not everybody's here to ascend And the digital ones, the best way that I will describe this is that they are here as extras. And you've heard that term too. Mm -hmm. Imagine that you are an actor, which everybody is, and you are being cast for the main role or some of the supporting roles. And you don't obviously get it. Uh, You're not seasoned enough, ready enough to take on this role. And, but they sure need a lot of extras. They need a lot of extras to walk around and just be extras. And in doing so, you get a taste of what it's going to be like for you when it's your turn to be called for the main role. Mm -hmm. You get a taste, you get an experience, you get to enjoy, especially now the awakening period. Everybody wants to be extras who aren't necessarily going to be here for the ascension. Mm -hmm. Um, They don't have auras the way that we see them even in our metaphysical sense, even those who are psychic and can see auras, they have a different light that comes from a different part of the light spectrum, which is not, we're not capable even in our extrasensory abilities right now to pick that up, even those who are sensitive to light, but they have light, they have consciousness, they have light. Um, They just can't be seen. And by, by virtue of not being able to be seen, you know who the digital ones are. And there are a lot of them. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And I love that. I love your explanation of that. Um, There is no higher or lower, right? It's just a matter of a particular role that's being played at a particular time. Yep. Even to that. I'm sorry. There is no high low anywhere. There is no high low. Exactly. And so I love that. I love that. And even to that, um no one is going to be left behind right nope. no one no there, there's the possibility that some will not 
some so the ones who graduate never came here to be left behind right they they're here just to experience mm-hmm. they'll go back and experience themselves in many different ways and in many different lives and many different universes somewhere else so that's not even a question for those who are here to ascend for the very few that don't they'll just come back and repeat the class again and i've heard you say that um they'll be the, at the top of the class yes they will they've taken the course before it's be- it's beautiful it's love it's perfection it's i i love that i love that <laughs> So um, I understand that you are a spiritual guide. So yes. uh, for those who who you have tapped into their energy, <laughs> who hmm, feel something when they hear you, yeah. uh, how would you like for them to contact you? Well, as most cases are, people who resonate with what I'm saying will feel it at a deeper level. It mm-hmm. just does. Mm-hmm. And it awakens something. And they just go and reach out to me on my website. It's the it's the closet spiritualist. Got to remember to put the thun there because there's another website called closet spiritualist and that's not me. So it's the closet spiritualist. You, it's a very simple website that you can see what I offer in terms of the services, the consulting. If you just want to tap into any question you want, we could do that. But most students, most people who reach out to me, are being called to be students. They want to go deep within themselves to remember this stuff that I'm talking about for themselves. And it's so there for them to access. They just don't know how. And so I become their guide. I literally tell them that I am the physical manifestation of any guy that you have ever felt has been with you since the beginning. And so they just do that and become my students. And we go through a three to four, maybe five month course of their awakening of their truth and then they usually go back out and do it for others thank you for that so um i'll have that information in the description box for uh for people um briefly briefly yes. um I've, i i did not want to overlook this point that you've made you've talked about that autism is not an illness it's Can not you just share a little bit more about that I, I feel that this is starting to bear light now. Um, the way that people in society look at autism, especially from those who are studying it, see it now differently in many regards than it was even five years ago. And this was going to bear itself out. Mm-hmm. Autism and people who are suffering from all sorts of mental illness, bipolarism, depression, what have you, they're vibing at a different frequency, a much higher frequency. And it's because they're vibing at a much higher frequency that that frequency cannot be easily measured in this simple third dimensional world. Henceforth, something must be wrong with them. It must be a disease. It must be an illness. It must be a condition. But in actuality, it's actually perfection. In actuality, it isn't about them not vibing with our frequency. When I mean our, I mean societal frequency. It's the fact that society hasn't yet evolved enough to to actually mirror their frequency. Because when we do as a world consciousness, those same people that have suffered dearly mentally and, and with depression, all sorts of things, and those who have who have been mislabeled with autism and other things mm-hmm. that are mental illnesses, they will be the ones that will shine their light on all mm-hmm. those who will struggle to get into what we would call the higher realms of fifth dimension. They will be the light of the world. They will articulate. They will be the ones to show the way. And they're waiting for it. I work with autistic people. And the way that I t- tap into them is I tap into them pretty easily into their fifth dimensional energy because I, t- I, I f- resonate a lot in fifth dimension. So when I do, I find myself having these beautiful conversations with, with people that supposedly could not articulate this because it's just not something in their wheelhouse. And they often finish my sentences before I could even explain to them the very things that I'm talking about right here. They know who they are. One day, the, the way that they communicate, which seems so so bland in some ways or so un, un, understood, 
it's going to sound like music. It's going to be poetry. It's going to be intelligence and wisdom, unlike anything that we have been exposed to. They came here purposely to be a higher frequency so that they can help greet us when we finally get there. It's absolutely beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. Franco, do you have any last words of me <laughs> for the audience? As if you haven't imparted enough. <laughs> yeah, I find that always kind of endearing because people, I'm like my my goodness, Caleb, who I've been channeling all this time, is just like, you know, throwing everything. But here's the thing. Um, the one thing that I know for sure, for sure, if you are listening to this, if this is in any way, shape, or form in your reality, it's not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. You were called to hear this, whether it was here in this show or somewhere else. You were called to hear this because you need to know who you are. You are perfection. You are God. And everything that you're doing right now is perfect. It's your way of trying to figure that out and remember that. Don't forget that. This is your moment. We call this a defining moment. It's a spiritual moment. You may not have had a near-death experience. You may not have had a spiritually transformative experience. But know that this moment that you're having right now, if it's resonating with you, is your spiritually defining moment. Because you're ready to wake up. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, so I'll have all of uh, his information in the description box. And uh, yes, yes. <laughs> and it's very, I, can, I could I could see your mind is just like, Ooh. it is. It's, it's, it's been a life affirming conversation. Thank you. And I really, really, really appreciate your presence. So if I hadn't said enough of that, I have closing remarks, Franco. Um, Franco. Yes. Much like the story of the woman who picks up a car to save her baby, both you and your mother were able to demonstrate just a glimpse of the power and magnitude that we all possess. And of course, the love that a parent has for their child is one of the portals through which our astounding abilities are able to pierce through the illusion we find ourselves in. And it is this same intense love that is behind your words, Franco, as you seek to help remind us all of who we really are, the energy of hope, peace, and love are on your tongue. Uh, and what is exciting about that, as you know, is that what we hear, what we believe, what we absorb, we create. And in that way, you are literally inspiring the world to experience our own light with exponential results. For every podcast by you stop that you stop by, every conversation that you have, every student that you teach, you are inspiring us all to live up to the truth of that which we really are. Thank you for your wisdom, your message, and your love. And like I tell every guest on my show, thank you for being here. Thank you for being on this planet right now. We benefit greatly from your presence here. And we are honored that you have joined us today. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you. And I'm going to go back and re-listen to this video <laughs> and re 
listen to these beautiful, beautiful uh, words of wisdom. And so thank you for for joining us. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank it's, you for those kind words. You're, you're absolutely welcome. And we end, I was, I was <laughs> ready to forget. We end with the heart. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and thank you all for stopping by. I hope that you have enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. Um, I hope that it's touched all your little tinglies, <laughs> your little, you know, everything to to really, really let you know, wow, this is incredible. So uh, subscribe, stop by Franco's webpage and, and reach out if you feel inspired to. And have a great week. Until next time, we love you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.